Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Happy to see all of your smiling faces this morning. I want to welcome you into the Fairgrounds Road Church of Christ Sunday morning Bible study, in which we are making our way through the book of Daniel. We are in chapter 2, and we will begin our deliberations this morning somewhere around verse 36. So if you are with us live here in person, we certainly appreciate you for being here. And for those of you who are tuning in on Facebook Live, we welcome you to our fellowship and study as well. And thank you for being with us. And we're going to begin, as we always do, with a word of prayer to our kind and benevolent God. Um, and we will then proceed with the word that he has provided for us thereafter. Let's bow. Father, we come this morning and we just lift you up and we praise you and we thank you for the opportunity to, to gather in your name and to fellowship with one another and to just grow deeper in love and knowledge for the truth that you've revealed to us. And I'm grateful for all the souls that are here, I'm grateful for the willingness to learn and to grow and to grow closer to you and closer to one another. We're mindful of those that aren't able to be here and we just, just pray for healing where that's needed and, and for peace for their absence. Father, we uh, ask you to be with us this morning that we can just study with open hearts and open minds to constantly seek your truth in our lives, and, but not just for our lives, but for the world that's around us, that we might reveal it to them in love and gentleness and as it's been revealed to us. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, everyone. We uh, last week uh, managed to get into the interpretation of the king's dream, the king being King Nebuchadnezzar. <clears throat> and uh, again, you'll recall that he had a dream and he required that his men uh, not only interpret that dream, but provide him with the text of the dream. Daniel comes along after he has prayed with his friends and to his God with the interpretation and the text of the dream and then begins to share it with the king after being certain to let him know that this interpretation was not coming from him as a person. He is just a person with no greater ability than any other person but God. And uh, we thought that that was a very important point. And then we got into the actual interpretation, or actually the providing of what the context of the dream was. And we zipped through there pretty good, but I, I was looking at it again this week and really wanted to bring out some of the historical aspects of what is there. Um, because, you know, around here at Fairgrounds Road, we believe in a deeper Bible study, amen? amen. Uh, we don't just skate along the surface like many might, but we, uh, <laughs> we, we get deep into it. And so I want to be able to share some things with you uh, that may add a little bit to our knowledge uh, and our appreciation of God and the way that he moves in these things. Now, um, Daniel says in verse 36, this was the dream. Now we will tell its interpretation before the king. Having done that, um, he then says, you, O king, are the king of kings to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory and wherever the sons of men dwell or the beasts of the field or the birds of the sky he has given them into your hand and has caused you to rule over them all you are the head of gold now you'll recall that as he described this statue uh, it was in several different pieces if you will um, in all one statue but the head was of gold and the shoulders and the breast were of silver uh, the abdomen was of brass and the legs were of iron, uh, and the feet were iron mixed with clay. Um, so when we talk about Nebuchadnezzar being the king of kings, uh, we typically associate that with what or whom? God, Christ, mm -hmm. right? Certainly. And so this, I don't want us to be confused with that because it is God who, in the interpretation, is saying, you, O king, are the king of kings. Now, he's talking about earthly kings. Mm -hmm. uh, not universal, or not sovereign, but those who are on earth at the time. And I think in order for us to have a better understanding of that, we, we need to understand the, the, the width 
and the depth of Babylon's um, prevalence, if you will. There was a guy named um, Barisus who was quoted by Josephus. Everybody know who Josephus is? Mm -hmm. Anyone not know who Josephus is? I know the name. You know the name? I know the name, yeah. yeah. He's the guy that sells ice cream in your neighborhood. <laughs> a bit down in Texas, huh? Bell. Blue Bell. Blue Bell, right. No, I said your neighborhood. <laughs> your neighborhood. Um, Dairy Queen. Um, he was a, a Jewish historian. And so as we read the Bible, we, a lot of people access Josephus because having, and he's kind of a controversial character, and I really don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but he's just someone who wrote about the history of the Jewish people. And so a lot of times when you're reading the Bible, you'll access Josephus to see what he might have had to say about what was going on during that time. And, and I'll just leave it at that. But, but what he wrote, quoting someone else, was that Babylon had in subjection Egypt, Syria, uh, Phoenicia, uh, Arabia, and that his exploits surpassed um, anything that the Chaldeans had done. Now, we not too long ago, several weeks ago, uh, Andrew favored us with some of the things that the Chaldeans were famous for and what they had done um, and, and how prevalent they were. And so what Nebuchadnezzar did uh, far surpassed them. They said that he was more celebrated than even Hercules in that his empire passed the pillars of Hercules. However, uh, as great of an extent as it was at that time, which was kind of unheard of, really, uh, it didn't last that long. In fact, um, it is said that that kingdom lasted about 70 years um, in that form, in that form. Does that sound familiar? No. Well, <laughs> didn't see that one coming. What that question? Oh, not a problem. Um, with with regard to Hercules, obviously he was one who was celebrated by the Greeks as a demigod, if you will. Right? Was he a real person? No, we don't think so. But there were things that were named after him. You'd be surprised at the things that we deal with every day that are um, remnants of the gods that were put into place by man through the Greeks. <laughs> yeah, 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 for, for, for sure. And, and so when you create these structures, you name them after these gods, and there was a place called the Pillars of Hercules. And so that's what's being referred to, not that he was a real person. Since we're over there, and I am ready for this, um, have you ever, um, in an ambulance scene, that staff with the two snakes swirled around it, mm -hmm. and sometimes with wings. Mm -hmm. um, you know what that's called? It's, it's called a caduceus. Caduce, yeah. Right? Caduceus, right? And that's a representation of one of the Greek gods. When you, talk, when you tell someone good luck, did you know that luck was a god? What? And when you wish someone good fortune, do you know that fortune was a god? Right, so there's so many things that we have in our day-to-day -day lives that are descendants of the idea of these Greek gods. You know, I, when I found that out, I stopped saying good luck. <laughs> I'm not suggesting that you do or don't. I was just, I was so surprised by that. Um, oh, sure. Every civilization, every civilization has them. And it's difficult to get away with because civilization has evolved and developed over time uh, and is subject to the influence of many, many different cultures. And so we live with things that we take for granted that are rooted in that, that we don't even know, that we don't even realize. Right? It, the, the days of the week, the planets, Mars was the god of war, right? Uh, Jupiter. So I mean, we're, we're just inundated by it. It's, it's all around us. Sports. Sports? I, I thought Nike. You know, I wouldn't doubt that God has names for the stars, but man <laughs> named and continuously names as they are discovered uh, things for uh, our identification. Right? So here again, we know the history of um, 
the naming of the planets as we have them today, and the naming of the days of the week, um, sometimes even the months. I mean, all of that has to do with things that are rooted in ancient history and gods. Small g. Hmm? Yeah. Mythology. Okay. All right. Um, so then we see that the statue represents four successive Gentile powers, and they are Babylon, uh, Persia, Greece, and Rome. So with this head of gold, it, it refers to Babylon as the beauty of the kingdoms and the glory of the Chaldeans' pride. And, and that head refers not so much to Nebuchadnezzar personally as it does to Babylon. Uh, Jeremiah 51, verse 41, I believe, describes it as the praise of the whole earth. And so um, this was modern-day Iraq. And it was the home of the seven, one of the seven wonders of the world. Does anybody know which one that is? The Hanging Gardens, Hanging Gardens of Babylon, right? And, and so uh, you may also recall that back in the days of Saddam Hussein, what was he doing? Yeah, he was trying to rebuild that stuff, right? These are things that God says, now that's never going to be again. But there he was trying to rebuild it. And of course, just like God said, now there's no Saddam Hussein and there's no hanging gardens. And a lot of the things that he was trying to reestablish to capture the glory of Babylon were once again destroyed. Uh, so these are how these things still are represented uh, even to this day. So we see that when you've got this head of gold in comparison to all the other kingdoms that have come before and to an extent, those who came afterwards, there's a reason why the appellation of gold was given to Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. Uh, because as splendid as the kingdom was under his reign and rule, uh, everything else would be in ways somewhat less than. So then we have this decreasing value of the metals that are being used to describe these other kingdoms. Um, The Medo-Persians, for instance, who came along after the Babylonians was a bit less splendid than that of Babylon. And uh, even though it was distinguished by its conquest and the different places that it went and took over, uh, it wasn't as magnificent and would be better represented as brass, which is why, you know, obviously we're not talking about gold, or that's to say silver. Uh, and then and it goes further on uh, with the rest of them as well. And so again, Babylon was very powerful, uh, but very short-lived, relatively speaking. So then we get down to verse 39. It says, after you, there will arise another kingdom inferior to you, then another kingdom of bronze, which will rule over all the earth. So specifically, the Medes and the Persians are referred to by God as inferior to those of the Babylonians. Now, um, there's a good reason for that. Um, part of it is that the Medo-Persian Empire, uh, they did not immediately succeed Nebuchadnezzar, but they came to power during his grandson Belshazzar's reign. So you remember um, handwriting on the wall fame? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's Belshazzar. And that was, it's referred, the Bible in its language refers to him as a son, but more likely he was a grandson. And so long after, uh, after uh, Nebuchadnezzar had passed out of power and perhaps even passed away, now you've got Belshazzar doing a bunch of things that we'll get to later on in our study, but the short story is he decided to take the treasures of God and have a party with them. And uh, God didn't appreciate that and handwriting <coughs> on the wall and that same night, the Medes and the Persians invaded uh, Babylon, and that was effectively the end of the Babylonian Empire. It came to an end that night. Um, now, of course, Cyrus was going to come out of that, and Jeremiah represented uh, him uh, as someone who was working for God, someone who was selected by God to free the people of Israel. And um, But it's interesting that as much as they came along and they took over Babylon, they had a lot of problems. Anybody ever see that movie 300? Mm -hmm. Really good movie, right? And, and so 
lot of times when we see that movie, we don't necessarily have the cultural, we don't have the context of it, especially as it relates to the Bible. Uh, but when we read about or see in that movie Leonidas and Aristides and Miltiades and uh, Themistocles and people like that, and then we see the names of cities like um, Salamis, Thermopylae, Marathon, um, Leuctra, those were places where the Medo-Persians suffered some crippling losses some crippling losses. And, and, and so when you start talking about comparing it to Babylon being a bit less than, this is where you see some of that. And it's interesting, I mean, how um, accurate all that was, but you had this guy who felt like he was a god and he's saying all these things to, um, um, to the king Leonidas and fall down and worship me and I'm a god and this, that, and the other thing. And he had all these people that he, t I mean, you know, it was, it was massive, and then for them to suffer that loss, and they suffered other losses, and ultimately their kingdom would give way to the next kingdom, which all the people that I just mentioned are Greek. And so then it was the Greeks who then took over um, after the Medo-Persians. Right? And I know you have some good stuff to say about that, Andrew. <laughs> I, said, I know you have some good history around there. <laughs> all right. Um, here's, here's something else that you don't know about the Medo-Persians. They were degenerates. They were absolute uh, degenerates. There was, a, from the time of a king named Xerxes in 479 BC, the symptoms of decay and corruption were all over the place. The citizens were <coughs> corrupted by and enfeebled by luxury. You know, when people are hungry, they tend to work hard and they tend to fight hard. But when they're successful, they tend to get lazy, and they tend to get decadent. And this is what the Medo-Persian Empire ended up falling to. Um, they, they, they confided, they, that is to say, they depended more on mercenary troops, people that they would hire, rather than taking people from their own population and going out and fighting. And then as you went and you took in these other populations, you didn't do the right thing there, and so it was always fragmented. And then you find these lesser people in authority uh, who were supposed to be administrators because things were so spread out and so disorganized, they began to take on military power, which further fragmented uh, the Medo-Persian Empire. And so we find that the Greeks made pretty easy work of getting rid of them because they had a weak central government. And... Um, Cyrus, in fact, was succeeded by a guy named Cambyses, who history tells us was a madman, right? You just can't have somebody crazy running the country uh, and, or an empire, and so that's what happened. And so it was quoted by a guy named Predo, says that they were the worst race of men ever governed an empire, ever. So they had a lot of problems, and they were eventually overthrown by those who, like I said, were Greek. Now, that, that said, Cyrus was a very important figure, and I've already kind of mentioned it, but what else can you tell me about Cyrus and what you know about him? He was sympathetic. Sympathetic to what? To the, to the Hebrews. Right. On the rebuilding of or the, uh, rebuilding Jerusalem. Right. Okay. So, 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 yeah. Cyrus was 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 definitely used by God. He was prophesied by Jeremiah and Isaiah, as a matter of fact, uh, that he would play this role. That again, um, he was the guy. Nebuchadnezzar having been used to kind of put the people of God into a timeout, um, Cyrus was the guy who was going to free them, and so he allowed them to repatriate the Promised Land. He allowed them to repatriate Israel. And not only that, but he helped fund the rebuilding of Israel. And so uh, this was all God at work according to his master plan. He never intended for the people of Israel to uh, be in exile forever. In fact, there was a very specific amount of time, 70 years, that they were to be that. And then they were going to go back home. And so Cyrus played a big role in that. And of course, if you follow that, um, there are some things that he did that paved the way for Christ. Uh, and we'll get into that a little bit later. 
And so then the Bible in verse 39 again says, then another third kingdom of bronze will rule all over the earth. This has to do with the Greeks. Now the parts of the image which were of brass in the belly denoting inferiority, not only to the head, but to the part which immediately preceded the breast and arms of silver, it's not even specified as in the former case that this kingdom would be inferior to the former. What we do know about the Greeks is that they went almost worldwide. And it's appropriate that uh, they were associated with brass because they were big users of brass. They, they probably refined and developed the use of brass for armaments and for um, um, well, armaments being weapons and in armor. And, and so they were known for their brass. Later on, other things would come along that were stronger in a metal form, but that was a big deal technologically. And of course, we are still influenced by the Greek Empire even to this day. When you look at the architecture in Washington, D.C., all that is Greek-inspired. We just talked about um, some of the gods that we have even in our society, even in English language, um, how we're influenced there. When you take a look at our system of government, democracy, Congress, and all of that, um, all of that comes from uh, the Greeks. So we're still, to this day, very influenced, as were the Romans who came after them. So the Romans took the Greek gods and just renamed them uh, with, with, with Roman names and, and things of that nature. Uh, so we know that um, there can be no reasonable doubt that this third kingdom is denoted by the empire that was founded by Alexander, uh, Alexander the Great. And he's the one who built the Macedonian Empire. Uh, he's the one who overthrew the Persian Empire. So we understand that he's the person that's referred to um, in this third kingdom. Now, when we get down to chapter 8, there's going to be another vision, another vision. And you're going to have these same countries that are denoted as well. And so Greek, again, shows up in Daniel chapter 8, verse 21, where the Bible says, And the rough goat is the king of Grecia, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Um, and then it goes on and like I said, I'm going to go and spend a lot of time in there, but there's a lot in Daniel 8 and 10 and 11 about Greece, and we'll get to that in due time. And so um, those are the first three kingdoms. Now, here we see in verse 40, then there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron, and as much as iron crushes and shatters all things, so like iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all these in pieces. And so what we're learning here is that Rome comes along and overtakes even the Greeks. And that takes us up to the time of Christ. We know that Rome had overtaken a lot of the world at that point, had beaten the Greeks back, and now were the world power. And of course, they had their way of doing things as well. I think that uh, it was mentioned last week that the way that they ran their kingdom was to push their armies out and try to subject people, and it caused them to be in battles all the time. Uh, and that wasn't a really sustainable model. There's a lot of things that they did, a lot of culture, a lot of building, a lot of roads. If you've been over anywhere near that part of the world, you can see that there are still Roman roads, still Roman cities, still Roman aqueducts or the ruins thereof. If you've actually been to Rome, uh, there are many of the buildings from this era that are still, well not many, but there are buildings that are still there. Um, we've all seen pictures of the Colosseum. We know that Christians, early Christians were killed in that Colosseum. Um, so it's all still there and you can go in there. And so there was a heavy influence uh, on the world from that time, again, even until this time. Uh, and so it's them who came along and so being, um, Equated with iron has to do with their belligerence. But again, that didn't work long term because people figured them out and started adopting their models of warfare and started using it against them. And then we see the decline of the Roman Empire. And of course, they're less than as well because they were pretty debaucherous people too. Right? If, if you've done any study in Roman history and you've seen what was going on even at the emperor level and certainly at the, the, the common level of people, uh, there were just a lot of things that were going on that we would find to be ill. <laughs> you know, not unlike today, actually, uh, but it was more a function of their culture and the way that their government worked that we saw um, how they behaved. 
Um, and of course, when we get down to verse 41, that you saw the feet and the toes, partly of potter's clay, partly of iron, it will be divided kingdom, but it will have in its toughest iron, and as much as you saw the iron mixed with common clay, but the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong, part of it will be brittle, and then you saw the iron mixed with the common clay that will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. So all that essentially means is that the way that the Romans ran their empire, the way they conquered people and tried to subject them um, really didn't work out, and it ended up bringing an end to uh, the Roman Empire. Um, but it gets very, very interesting in verse 44. I mean, I've been talking and lecturing here, which is not typically my... Um, way of doing things. Any thoughts or comments about anything we've talked there's about? A, there's an alternate kind of way to interpret the legs. The, when, so Alexander the Great died very young. They conquered the world and he died very young. And you have four generals that then fought amongst themselves for the kingdom. And it ended up, I think, two. It got down to two. And they ended up dividing between the south and the north. The Ptolemy kingdom of Egypt was yeah, one Egypt. of them. And who was it? Seleucids. Seleucids, yeah. Right. Yeah, Seleucids. And so the thinking is that those legs are transitional. You know, so Greece is going out, Rome is coming in. Um, so that's another way to look at possibly the legs, because there were, ended up being two of them. Right. right. And they were split. Right. Right. That's a good addition. Absolutely. Um, So, so we've seen each of these other three kingdoms has had an important influence on the world and in preparing for the introduction of Christianity. Uh, it was designed and accomplished as an important part of the history of redemption, uh, if you will, and the agency of the Roman Empire was more direct and important than any or all of these because that's the one that was in present, again, as Christ came into the scene. Um, that kingdom performed more direct and important work in preparing the world for his coming. A lot of, like I talked about, with the transportation, um, with the technology, with um, the authority to put the Son of God to death. Remember, the Jews didn't have the authority, it was not legal for them to exercise the death penalty under Rome. And so this is why they got Pontius Pilate involved and sent Jesus to him. And again, Pontius Pilate didn't want anything to do with it. He wanted to wash his hands of it. But they insisted and they needed them. So it was that system of government which allowed this prophecy uh, to come into being. Um, it said that the ancient disposition sort of came to an end at that point, And the next dispensation came in after that. And Christianity came out of Roman occupation. So all this has to do with the things that God put in King Nebuchadnezzar's mind thousands of years ago, many thousands of years ago. Yeah? It's interesting, too, that Alexander the Great Hellenized the world, so he brought the name Greek to the world. Well, then Roman, namely the sister of Romans would develop Latin and replace the Greek language to make Latin for the great language for the world. So right at the close of the New Testament, Yeah, and we're always talking about how the Bible was, you know, written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And you know, and to your point about Latin and, and Rome taking over, <clears throat> we we ended up with Septuagint from that. Does anybody know what Septuagint is? Heard it? Right, and so, so the Greek language became prevalent in the world, right, prevalent in the world. And, and so when you, even when you do deeper study in the New Testament and you talk about um, who wrote what, a lot of it is how they did with the language. Um, was Luke good? Luke was probably someone who was a Gentile because he was super good with the Greek language. And of course it was written in there, and you know, Paul, 
uh, uh, referred to himself as a citizen of Rome, which he was at that time, but he would have had access to that language as well. And so our translation came from the Greek translation. And so here again, even to this day, we're influenced by the things that happened then, and God was talking about it in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. <laughs> That's just fascinating and amazing how prevalent God is, how timeless God is, how purposeful and intentional God is, how his plan uh, is irrefutable. And even when we can't see what that plan is, where it's not possible for us to know what that plan is, as we study the past and we take a look at the present and contemplate the future, we can see God moving all throughout it. Uh, I think we shared last week um, about Abraham uh, being told by God to go to uh, Moriah, which was the name at that time of Jerusalem. And that great sacrifice was supposed to have taken place there. And a sacrifice did take place there. Only to find out 2,000 years ago, it was the same place <laughs> that the sacrifice of Christ took place. And so just the way that God does things is fascinating. Um, and and I, I don't know. I'm, I'm biased, but it's, it's amazing to me that people wouldn't have faith in him when you, when you know those types of things. But Oh yeah, in, in ways that we don't even realize a lot of times without a deep, deep study about times and places and, 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 and events uh, that go on. And there are many, there are many. Um, but we see that, yeah. With everything from the stream on in the scripture, on the timeline, is affected by the prophecies of the stream, or the fulfillment of the prophecies of the stream. So I mean, Esther was part of Xerxes, so he was having that party in Esther 1 and Right. That instigated the Alexander to attack the of Persia. Right. Which leads to, I mean, everything just tumbles down. And you see its effect, influence on Jerusalem as we continue to read through the scriptures. You know, mm -hmm. it's just keeps unfolding as you go through. It's, yeah, it's quite fascinating. It's amazing prophecy. stuff. Yeah, it is. Um, so, verse 44 then. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. And as much as you have, uh, in as much as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future so that the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. Now, let's talk about this whole stone and how it crushes all these other kingdoms. What do you suppose that's about? Yeah, multinational, multiracial. Um, it, it, it recognized no borders or anything like that. And so when you start talking about this stone, and remember as he described this dream that there was a stone that was come out of a mountain, that stone grew, it rolled, it crushed into dust and blew away and lasted forever. Okay? Um, so there are those who would look at that stone as Christ, and there are those who would look at that stone as Christianity. I won't debate uh, that because ultimately it comes down to the same thing. That you had the kingdom of Babylon, the kingdom of the Medo-Persians, the kingdom 
of the Greeks and the kingdom of the Romans. And now we're talking about the kingdom of God, the divine kingdom. So as we see it described here in this dream, this was going to become prevalent amongst all kingdoms that had ever existed. Um, again, one not made with hands. In other words, men did not build this. This is from God. This is divine. And there are many references in the New Testament to the kingdom of God. Uh, and, and so we find ourselves, even now, in the kingdom of God. And Christianity, I don't believe, is everything that it's going to be. Uh, in fact, I think we're taking some blows right now. Because those who claim to be Christians are doing some decidedly unchristian things, even as institutions, even within their religions. There are many things that they are um, giving their consent to, that there are things that they are supporting. Uh, so I don't know that we're in our finest hour uh, as Christianity uh, as it is right now, but the prophecy is there that this will at some point take over the world. And of course, when we start taking a look at our view of heaven uh, in Revelation chapter 7, uh, the, the, the Bible says, And then I saw a multitude which no man could number, of all nations, all tongues, all people. And so we know that that is what's going to happen. And this, once again, is now yet in our future. Is there, is there ready? Can we see that? Mm -hmm. That's not the state of things right now because there are so many things out there and so much disagreement. And so this is not what's being referred to here, which means that it has to be yet in our future. So here again, going all the way back to the time of Nebuchadnezzar in this dream, he talked to him about things, I mean, he was only going to be around for another, you know, couple of decades, and then he's passed from the scene, but God has talked to him about things that would happen thousands and thousands of years later, even to our future, which means that the study of this Bible, and certainly of this book in Daniel, is relevant to us, it's important to us, and it should be critical to us to understand, to the very best of our ability, what God is saying to us, and he's saying quite a bit quite a bit, not only about the past and history, which sort of gives the track record, but if all this is true and we can see it and it's proven fact, there's no reason for us to have any doubt whatsoever or any lack of faith in those things that are yet in our future. Thank you. 
too. But that is also a kind of object lesson in, in that, you know, listen. <laughs> it's like you may seem like you're a head of gold and there's arms of silver, but guess what? A rock from God will destroy all of that and we blow away the dust. Oh, yeah, utterly. <laughs> utterly. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great, great point, Andrew. I appreciate that because, you know, once again, one of the things that I try to do and one of the things that I try to encourage us all to do is to look deeper into the Scripture. Um, and I'm not suggesting that we just make up fanciful stuff, but just see what's there. Uh, God could have represented this dream in any kind of way, but he chose to represent the statue as a human being, as a, as a man. And you know how fallible we are how fragile we are, how delicate we are, and that the smallest thing from him could destroy the greatest things of us. Um, now, God is not about destruction, but it has to do with sometimes our, our, our it has to do with our sin, it has to do with our ego, uh, it has to do with the fullness that we think that we have in ourselves, and God says no to all of that. No, to all of that. It's always going to be my way. It's always going to be my law. It's always going to be the things that I create that will endure. And the sooner you get on board with that, <laughs> the less painful you'll find that things are. And the more fulfilled you'll be. Because once again, uh, this dust that he can return us to is the same dust that he made us out of. And so we are his product. We are his children. And he is sovereign in all things. And that's where we need to be. So that was Andrew, great comments there. I, I appreciate that. Um, we're after, we got a couple of minutes. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, let's do this. Let's go 46 through 49, uh, because when we get into chapter 3, then it's going to be it's going to be really good. Kevin's mouth is watering over there, just waiting for us to get to chapter 3. So let's wrap up chapter 2. I've got to restudy the whole thing. It's taking so long. <laughs> and, and I speak very empathetically about that because I tend to take a long time too. So good. Indeed, indeed. Just let me know when you feel that your time is being wasted. How about that? <laughs> Verse 46, then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and did homage to Daniel and gave orders to present to him an offering and fragrant incense. The king answered Daniel and said, surely, watch this, surely your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries since you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. And Daniel made request of the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the administration of the province of Babylon while Daniel was at the king's court. All right, so what just happened? A couple of really important things, and then we'll wrap it up. The king praised God. The, the king acknowledged God. Now, whether he had a full understanding of who God is, I mean, he was so impressed that Daniel had the ability to not only interpret the dream, but to tell him the dream. And then Daniel had already told him, it's not me, it's God. He then comes back and says, well, your God is surely God of gods, Lord of kings, and a revealer of mysteries. So he's given him some credit. That's not to say that Nebuchadnezzar has experienced a conversion. Because there's nothing here that says that he experienced a conversion. But when you find yourself in the face of things that you don't understand and you can't explain and someone says this is what it is, then you go with it. And that's what we see here with Nebuchadnezzar. What else? Yeah, because he said he's the big God, not the only God. Right. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's an important point, because here again, when we get into chapter 3, I mean, immediately he goes into building this idol <laughs> that he wants people to worship. Uh, but in, in, in the short term here, he is so amazed and impressed that he has these things to say, and he also rewards Daniel, promotes him 
um, gave him a lot of gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men. Now, it makes sense that he would make him chief prefect over all the wise men because the wise men could or could not do what? Right? I, I'm not going to say that they were useless. I'm sure they had their uses, but when it came to something that the king really wanted, they didn't have any ability to do that. So here's one who comes out of nowhere and has the ability to do it. Fine, I'm putting you in charge. Right? That's the same thing that Pharaoh did with um, Joseph. Right? And this isn't a small thing. They think this makes him second behind Nebuchadnezzar and everybody else in the kingdom. Yeah. He's the chief of the governors and all the wise men. So he's he's got political power. He's, got, he, he's in a position now to influence. Them. And wealth. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like a, yeah. uh, it's almost like a regency. It's like Joseph Wilson. Like yeah. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. And of course, what does Daniel do? He looks after his boys. He looks after his boys, right? And that further, further adds the influence of God to the people of Babylon as well as the people of God. And so when we go into the next chapter, we see that the first thing that happens is that these guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are highlighted in ways that we still talk about to this day. You know, it's, it's, it's one of my favorite concepts in all of the Bible. Three simple words. But if not. All right? And we'll get into that. So I encourage you to take a look um, in chapter three. Go ahead and read that. Um, study that. And if you have any questions, call Kevin. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> 